Hello, everybody. Welcome. I hope you're doing well. Um, today, we're going to read Evelyn Underhill's book, Mysticism. Look at the bookmarks like that. Uh, studying the nature and development of spiritual consciousness. And I'm at the ocean, right? I'll turn around for a second. I, I wish I could, you know how I always wish I could just turn around. Uh, it's a little foggy now. It wasn't before. There's the, uh, the cliff over there. All right. Um, okay, so let's start. We're on a new chapter and life is beautiful. Life is good. I hope your life is, is going well. If not, then just sit here and watch how it turns around after we spend an hour reading Evelyn Underhill. Now, um, C.S. Lewis and her corresponded. I love C.S. Lewis. Uh, and Charles Williams was part of the Inklings with J.R.R. Tolkien and, and C.S. Lewis. And um, anyway, they all had to do with Evelyn Underhill in some way. I put some more in the description below and a link so that you can get this book yourself if you want to read it yourself in a PDF form for free. It's online because it was written in 1910. And so um, it's nice and breezy in here. I wish you guys had the same view that I did, but <laughs> I'll turn it around sometimes when there aren't people. I, I'm sure I'll remember to do that. Sometimes I go down there, but there's like construction right now in some of the, the fancy houses. That's what I call them. <laughs> They used to be $14 million houses. No, there are a lot more. Um, I used to come here when no houses were there in this particular place. So anyway, we're on chapter nine. So why not be at the beach uh, when we're going through the dark night of the soul? It's no joke, this dark night of the soul, right? But it's purposeful. I was just reading about it in another book. So if you want to take a screenshot, I do that for for this part so you can see um, what she's, she says we're going to talk about. You know, sometimes, and welcome if you're on the podcast too, This when I, I put this out finally as a podcast as well, uh, so you wouldn't see the beach anyway. You'd just be listening wherever you are. Welcome, welcome. It, this is such an amazing book. We're on, uh, just trust that you got this video for a reason. So listen to this one and then you can go back to the beginning and listen to this all over again. Uh, we're on the second half of the book, which is in the mystic way. It's called the mystic way is the second half. And uh, this is the dark night of the soul chapter nine of the second part of the book. But it'll, this is, you're, you're starting on a new chapter. Sometimes we're just in the middle of a chapter. So welcome and um, anyway. So it says, we have wandered during the last few chapters from our study of the mystical life process in man the organic growth of his transcendental consciousness in order to examine the byproducts of that process, its characteristic forms of self-expression, the development of its normal art of contemplation or introversion and the visions and voices, ecstasies. Last chapter was on ecstasy, right? And I talked about, I saw Saint Teresa of Avila in a statue by Bernini from, from the 1500s when I was just in Rome. Just in Rome. I happened to be there. I, I, anyway, you, you'd have no, you, you couldn't believe how I got there and how that happened and how I got lost. And then suddenly I was at this church with Saint Teresa of Avila where the order of Saint John of the Cross was, right? That's where they went. The Carmelites went there after they were being persecuted in this church. It was of St. Paul. I think it's called of St. Mary now. It's on Susanna Street, I think. Susan Street. I remember because Susan's one of the characters in the Narnia books, right? Anyway, it, it was so random, quote random, but it was like, anyway, you can see that one minute video if you want. Uh, just put, just look up Dr. Cheryl Meyer and Miracle in Rome and it's a one minute video. It's so cool. Okay. And so, um, Ecstasies and raptures. It was it was Saint Teresa of Avila in ecstasy. That's what the sculpture was, and it had the sun shining down on her, like the sun's usually shining in my videos, like randomly. You know, I don't I don't plan that. I don't plan that. It's just 
I feel like this with the sun, like we're, we're, we're one, you know, the sun, you know, like the son of God and the sun, which is like a representation of, of that light, you know, just, um, a small, like an icon, right? It's pointing to the real thing, right? Welcome here. I'm so glad you're here. Uh, I wish you much love and, and all of that, right? Okay. So the visions and voices, ecstasies and raptures, which are frequent, though not essential, accompaniments of its activity, of the ever-increasing predominance of its genius for the real, though not essential accompaniments of its activity, of the ever-increasing predominance of its genius for the real, R-E-A-L with a capital R, right? All right, but the mystic, like other persons of genius, is man first, a oh, man or a woman, right? She uses man, and she uses a woman usually for soul, but man first and artist afterwards. We shall make a grave, though common mistake, if we forget this and allow ourselves to be deflected from our study of his growth in personality by the wonder and interest of his art, right? We're not noticing the growth in the personality of this mystic, of the mystic you, you know, or the mystic me or the mystic anybody. You know, we're all like Saint Mother Teresa said, we're all called to be saints. I think it's in the Bible as well, right? And so, um, I was listening last night, I woke up at like four or three for an hour, three until four in the morning. And so I just started playing uh, the abandonment to divine love. I, I think that's John Pierre de Cassade. And he was a Jesuit priest, but it was so good. And I had been looking up the title to, to link it on somewhere, you know, one of my videos or something. And so my PDF that reads me, you know, the PDFs with Brian, the voice, <laughs> the voice that's British for me. He's like my best friend too, right? Um, it had gone back to the beginning. I was usually in the middle of the book, but at the beginning, it's like the first three pages were exactly what I needed to hear. And it's exactly talking about this. And it's so good. It's so good. So I highly recommend that. I have a few pages of it on my on my YouTube if you want to just look it up and, and but I'm ha I'm not reading it myself and Brian is reading it for you guys because I'm like I'm not gonna read this by myself not last night I almost did it last night and today I was listening to it I almost just do screen record and then I can put it on because it's it's free domain as well anyway uh, it's called abandonment to divine providence I think if I called it the right name yeah if we forget this and allow ourselves to be deflected from our study of his growth in personality by the wonder and interest of his art, being, not doing, is the first aim of the mystic. Man, I, I want to get a pen and r underline this. This was, look, 1910, right? I forgot to read for you guys what this chapter is about, The Dark Night of the Soul. Uh... I'll just read the first because I read it at the end of the last video, so you can go to that and listen. But it's a return to the study of the mystical life process, the swing back from illumination, the dark night, its psychological character, a period of psychic fatigue, reaction from the strain of mystical lucidity, the sorting house of the spiritual life. Its onset is gradual, says Madame Goyon, a state of mental chaos. Oh, I was just reading this part of a Jordan Peterson book that was talking about chaos and order and the yin and the yang and all that kind of stuff. And I have an Eckhart Tolle live class tonight. I love him. I love him because he, he talks about how Mary and Martha, Mary chose the one thing and it shall not be taken from her, one thing. That's being, okay? So I had this coach that was teaching me. He's like, it's being first. And then I have a little quote. If I was at my house, you could see it. I have a little post-it note on the wall that says, all I have to do is be, right? It reminds me of this because we forget. We forget all the time. I don't know about you. I forget all the time. Now, now, as divine love, 
takes away everything out of my heart that I depended on before that I thought was necessary and so there's nothing else left but God <laughs> then you're all you can do is be it's really great because you're just being all the time there's almost no doing left you will do what you're inspired to do and what your state is called to so I'm a mom so I show up in my mom duties right but if you get caught up in identifying yourself as I'm a mom I'm a psychologist I show up on my psychology duties right and it's like if you get caught up in that excuse me what you're still popped from Rome right then you run after your your idea of what a mom is your idea of what a mystic is your idea of what you know a girlfriend is or whatever or mom or whatever whatever role you have in your state of life um, or or don't have right um, anyway as God takes you through this journey and as you surrender to it then uh, you see everything else does become like a candlestick like a little taper candle and God is like the sun and you're just like whatever get in line <laughs> like, it's so refreshing like I always want to stay in this place so I'm glad to be reading this today with with you guys welcome welcome um, feel free I, I'm just, I was checking first before I said it because I don't even care to say this, but feel free for the sake of the algorithm to, to put a thumbs up on this so that other people know, you know, that are just looking on the surface. Maybe they ought not to see this. Maybe there ought not to be a lot of thumbs up, but whatever. Let them know and then, um, that's the Radiohead guy. Uh, and there's a, a, anyway, we recognize each other. Uh, there's a, anyway, YouTube will push out um, YouTube will push out this video if there's more comments or if you watch this all the way through. So thank you just for your presence, right? All right, I'll stop talking about that kind of stuff. Right now, I only have it on YouTube. I don't plan to put it anywhere else unless I make this a whole class later in the future, which I, I wouldn't doubt. All right, so being, not doing, is the first aim of the mystic. Thank the maker quote Star Wars, right? And hence should be the first interest of the student of mysticism. We have considered for convenience sake, excuse me, it's like this natural thing to just want to pop my ear. So plus I was up for like half the night, I don't know, maybe just that hour. We have considered for the convenience sake all the chief forms of mystical activity at the halfway house of the transcendental life. But these activities are not, of course, peculiar to any one stage of that life. Ecstasy, for instance, is a common feature of mystical conversion as of the last crisis or, quote, mystic marriage of the soul. Where was that? Vide Supra, the case of Suso and Pascal. We did talk about that in the last chapter. Whilst visions and voices in selves of a visionary or auditory in selves of a visionary or auditory type uh, accompany and illustrate every phase of the inward development. So if you're more of a visual type, you might get visions. If you hear audible things all the time, you know, like songs or whatever, you'll get inward auditory messages. It's just one way to describe it. I'll just let her keep describing it. Anyway, they uh, accompany and illustrate every phase of the inward development. They lighten and explain the trials of purgation as often as they express the joys of illumination and frequently mark the crisis of transition from one mystic state to the next. Okay, so what she's saying, and I don't know if I said I'm a psychologist for the past 20 plus years, and so, and I've been studying this for a long time more than 30 years, I'll say that, since I was one. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, we're ageless. So is that, like what I was saying, like what I was learning in the abandonment to the divine providence is uh, Jean-Pierre de Cassade was saying that, you know, when you're resigned, when you're surrendered, when you're like, I am your servant, you know, 
or like I am a child. I was just reading in the Bible. It was saying in Mark, I think nine or 10, it was like, you have to be like a little child or else you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Like it's one of those, if you do not forgive people, you will not be forgiven. The, those surprising verses that you're like, wait, what? I won't be forgiven? No, because how can love flow through you when you have this whole block of resentment? And love needs to flow through you to clean you. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they see God, right? And so in order to be like a little child, a little child will hold the hand of their parents and like be led, be led and be, that's so funny. I heard lead, lead turned to gold, you know, be that too. You're, you're being purified. And so when you do the whole lyric that often comes to me, because I love roses, rise, open your soul eyes. That's what a rose reminds me of. And he rose from the dead and he arose other people from the dead. Jesus, right? It's like a la vie en rose. Give your heart and soul to me and life will always be la vie en rose. It will be like this ocean view. No? The sun shining above, right? Give your heart and soul to me. Your life will be like that. It will. I can attest. I can attest. No matter what horrible things have gone on and are going on, right? I'll do this. Um, uh, I'm blocking the girls walking, the women walking by my, my car in case they don't want to be on video. All right. And so, um, when you do that, like what Jean-Pierre de Cassade was saying and what Evelyn Underhill is saying in, in this, in this whole book, right? When you, when you surrender to that process, he was saying in the book today, I'll just share this one thing. It was so good. It was so amazing because this earlier this week I was I was um standing up for a, a certain cause and usually I don't stand up for certain causes but this one I did and I kept getting the song redemption song by Bob Marley and so it's like old pirates yes they rob I sold I to the merchant ship right um many minutes after they took I from the bottomless pit right anyway songs of freedom but anyway so Jean-Pierre de Cassade was saying and if a pirate ship because he I don't know when he wrote maybe the 1600s I'm guessing he said when a pirate ship comes by and you're in the surrendered state to God right and you're on a boat and you're like oh well there's a pirate ship he's like a sudden wind will also come by right before that and blow you past their range or or not you know what I mean he didn't go into or not but I've experienced the or not and when you're just surrendered then you're uh, Eckhart Tolle said it's a good thing to ask all the time am I at ease am I at ease in this moment am I surrendered to whatever divine love wants to bring into my life and teach me or teach others through me or whatever all right do you see how it makes your life um, lovey and rose like people attack you and you're like all right okay this is just chipping at whatever and you learn how to not identify with it you know or people keep doing odd things that were irritating before and you're just like all right everybody's in their stage of growth let them be let it be let it be right when I find myself in times of trouble that might be a quote from someone, right? We've all said that though, so that could be anyone. Anyway, one exception, however, must be made to this rule, the most intense period of the great swing back into darkness, which usually divides the quote, first mystic life or illuminative way from the second mystic life or unit, wait, illuminative way, sorry, the illuminative way is the first one from the second mystic life or unitive way is generally a period of utter blankness and stagnation. Ah. So far as mystical activity is concerned, the dark night of the soul, once fully established, is seldom lit by... Oh, you can't see them over there. Now they're walking on that side. Is seldom lit... by visions or made homely by voices. It's not made homely by like, oh, I keep getting a song, yeah. It is of the essence of 
its miseries, that the once possessed power of horizon or contemplation is now wholly lost. The self is tossed back from its hard won point of vantage. Impotence, blankness, solitude are the epithets by which those immersed in this dark fire of purification describe their pains. Oh, I just did a video, I posted it this morning on, um, well, now you'll know the date of this, but uh, that I'm videoing this is, you are brave, you are brave. And it talks about one of the seven virtues that we ought to, de to develop or God is developing in us, right? If you're just being, God is doing that. If you're surrendered to divine love, right? Is fortitude and fortitude is courage and courage is bravery and bravery. It's said in the face of pain and agony and um, misperceptions or people putting you down, intimidations, all these, all these words that you get to face in the dark night of the soul. That's how you develop real bravery, right? You can't. You can ask God, go watch, watch, watch what happens when you ask God sincerely and say, God, bring me into union, bring me into bravery, help me be truly brave, not act brave, not act my idea of courage, but truly brave. And these things will happen to you and you'll enter in the dark night of the soul. So don't be surprised when you're there. That's why I'm making these videos. So you're not utterly and completely alone. Like even when I'm alone in the dark night of the soul, I have my Lord of the Rings book, right? And I can't, sometimes I'm called not even to find consolation in that, or I don't find consolation in that because you're just not in a place of consolation. Um, a priest named Timothy Gallagher that I've had a silent retreat with, with a bunch of other people, there were like 300 or more of us all silent. It was you could feel the silence. It was so cool. I recommend silence. But he talks about consolation and desolation. He has lots of books about, he is teaching St. Ignatius's consolation and desolations. And he teaches be very reverent. I think he might be a SJ too. This is a Jesuit. I'm not sure. It's the Order of St. Mary, I think. I think, I'm not sure if that's just a different order, but anyway. <sighs> so immerse in this dark fire purification, describe their pains. It is this extraordinary episode in the life history of the mystic type to which we have now come. Dun, da, da, welcome. We have already noticed the chief psychological characteristics of all normal mystical development. We have seen that the essence of this development consists in the effort to establish a new equilibrium, to get, as it were, a firm foothold upon transcendent levels of reality, and that in its path towards this consummation of the self, this consummation, the self experiences a series of oscillations between states of pleasure and states of pain, right? Bravery is getting through both that, right? Put it, put in another way, it is an extraordinary movement of the whole consciousness toward higher centers. You have different centers of being. I did a whole series through the book, The New Man. And some people that are Christians can't understand why I read The New Man. I'm just guessing that I haven't heard a lot of feedback, but part of my old self growing up evangelical right and um he's like why do you read that but maurice nicole dr maurice nicole talks about the different centers of man and how there's higher centers and lower centers and now jesus always is talking from the highest center but you know you can like he's teaching you how to raise to those levels just by immersing yourself deeply in the gospel i believe that can happen that's why you know you're not without you're not without, you're not left without, you don't need all of these amazing books, you know, like I have so many in my, in my library, but I read a saint book that was talking about these Hezekiahists or something, you know, saints in the desert, maybe desert fathers that were saying, we don't touch a book unless God calls us to that. Otherwise, you can go into spiritual gluttony and you're just chasing after mystic highs. You know, you can go after people online like that too. Believe me, 
I know people in real life or online or whatever, you can keep chasing after that. And this is why people are drawn to, you know, um, I'll just say what Saul went to and Saul had banned and then he went to someone, uh, a medium. I'll say it like that. I don't like saying some words. I don't want my video to get triggered in certain ways, but I can't control all of it. So, um, this is why when you're not hearing from God, because maybe you're not repenting of something, or maybe you are, and you're just in a desolation, you're in the dark night of the soul. And I remember St. Ignatius says, when you're in a desolation, don't change the choices you made when you were in your consolation, when you were felt connected with God. Because, you know, when we're in these dark places, we feel like I need to do this and that and that, you know. But he says, do what you can to get out of the desolation but do what you can by like staying in deep prayer for other people and prayer and surrender to God and those kinds of things and making sure you're, you're staying with the order that you committed to, you know, your life of, of prayer. Um, not just, uh, anyway, he describes all of it. And so does Timothy Gallagher. So you're in good hands. We have seen, um, okay. We've already noticed the chief psychological characteristic of all normal mystic development. We have seen that the essence of this development consists in the effort to establish a new equilibrium. So it's like in the Bible where it says, renew your mind, you know, metanoia, the word for repentance in Greek, meta is metamorphosis of your noose, noia. Like this is always what's being done when you have true repentance, never fear, your mind is getting purified, you know? ask God to help you. I'm like, just sorry. <laughs> I'm like, I just looked up for us. And there's a guy that looks like Jake Jillian Hall out there. I'm like, hello. Sorry. I, I didn't, I didn't mean to look up. I'm going to roll down the window so we get some air in here. <laughs> anyway, I'm still a person, right? Uh, we have seen, okay. So a new equilibrium to get as it were a firm foothold upon the trans i like how she says a firm foothold on the transcendent levels of reality right and that in its path toward this consummation the self experiences a series of oscillations between states of pleasure and states of pain put in another way it is an orderly movement of the whole consciousness towards higher centers in which each intense and progressive affirmation fatigues the immature transcendental powers and is paid for by a negation either a swing back of the whole consciousness or a, a stagnation of i mean a stagnation of the intellect a reaction of the emotions or an inhibition of the will and so those things, right, you get triggered and then you can get pulled right back into your old way of being. That's why I was just reading in Blessed Theophylact this morning. He was saying, or yesterday morning, yesterday morning, he was quoting, I mean, it was in the gospel. Jesus was saying, you know, in the end times, which I was taught the end times are right after Jesus rose from the dead. That's the beginning of or when, we, when he was crucified. That's the beginning of the end times which is cool. Anyway, um, says what he was talking about, the destruction of Jerusalem as well. But if anyone is at the height is on the roof of their house, don't go back down into the house to get anything, right? If you're in the Hills, don't go back to get anything that you go. Oh, I forgot this. If you're in the heights of contemplation of mysticism, don't go backwards. This is what Jesus is teaching us in that. If you're, in, if a man or a woman, right? If a person is in a field and they left their garment, don't go back to get your garment. Your garment, he, blessed Theophylact, this bishop from the 1100s was saying, your garment is like um, your old self, you know, your flesh that you put down, that you put away that you let go of. Don't go back to get that for any reason, right? Jesus says, put your hand to the plow and don't look back. The person who looks back is not worthy of my calling, right? God will teach you how to not look back, that you just get burned when you look back. When you try to grab that, then you get lost for a year or three years or whatever. And it's like, it's not worth it. You learn and learn and learn. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. I can't just tell you it's not worth it. You'll learn that by your experience, right? All right, someone just parked next to me, so I didn't know if they were going to be talking when they got out and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, 
Okay. So she said, uh, in which each intense and progressive affirmation fatigues the immature transcendental powers and is paid for by a negation, either a swing back of the whole consciousness, a stagnation of the intellect, a reaction of the emotions, or an inhibition of the will. Like you see, if I was still thinking, you know, that a guy would complete me, you know, then I would have stopped this video and not finished this and ran after, you know, single Jake Gyllenhaal, right? Whatever, like I'm not gonna, I don't have to chase anything. <laughs> but anyway, I'm just saying, you see, so the immature transcendental powers, I'm not saying I'm super mature, I wish, like I give that to God, I surrender that to God. I don't have to judge either way, it's awesome. You don't compare yourself to other people. We're not meant to, God has put you on this path. So, so ask, ask divine love, ask God to help you be surrendered and be completely surrendered to whatever God wants, right? I recommend that, but anyway. Thus, the exalted consciousness of divine perfection, those are capital D and P, divine perfection, which the self acquired in its mystical awakening was balanced by a depressed and bitter consciousness of its own inherent imperfection. And the clash of these two perceptions spurred it to that laborious effort of accommodation which constitutes the purgative way and we've talked about that the renewed and ecstatic awareness of the absolute which resulted and which was the governing characteristic of illumination brings with it of necessity its own proper negation the awareness that is to say of the self's continued separation from and incompatibility with that absolute which it has perceived. During the time in which the illuminated consciousness is fully established, the self as a rule is perfectly content, believing that in this sublime vision of eternity, this intense and loving consciousness of God, it has reached the goal of its quests. Sooner or later, however, psychic, there's the word, right? Psychic fatigue sets in. The state of illumination begins to break up. The, the complementary negative consciousness appears and shows itself as an overwhelming sense of darkness and deprivation. Wow. Okay, as a psychologist, I have to share this with you guys. It's so important. Is that this is exactly what happens in relationships. They say you enter into the power struggle in your relationship anywhere between two hours into that after the romantic phase anywhere between two hours and two years i think so two years in that the the power struggle starts to ensue unless you've gone through that and let go of your pain body and you're not in your egotism anymore and you're living the power of now right and surrendered to god I don't know, like, I, anyway, we're still humans, but, um, and so I kind of say, like, this is my summation of it as a psychologist working with couples for years and years and years too, and individuals, is that God sort of tricks us in that romantic phase because we see how the relationship could be. And that's just like the mystic phase. You go, or the, oh, Jake's back. And you go and you, sorry, I won't interrupt. I, I don't plan to interrupt anymore. You go and you um, have this mystic experience with God and you think it's always going to stay like that. And you ask God, please, can it stay like this? And you read Brother Lawrence and he's like, it stayed like this. And I was so surprised. But then you read because he stayed practicing the presence of God. He stayed in that presence. But when you go back, you read, you know, he uh, like was hobbling on one leg. He had to roll himself onto a ship to do the manifest and roll with the barrels and roll over the barrels. And I mean, he, the, this guy had a lot and lot, a lot of hardships. He already had the dark night of the soul before he reached this presence. And then he was surprised that the presence of God didn't leave him, you know, like my bracelet. I wear that to remind myself, you know, it says, and lo, I am with you always, right? Even when I don't feel it, um, God is, God is the isness is you're made out of the I am the isness of God so it's there you don't have to 
try to be present just be present and then you'll know be still and know god gives us an, an answer for every time you can know this isness of god but it might not be this high just like um in a relationship if you work through the power struggle and you guys are each of you you know the each of you has worked through that then you get back to this place that's like better than the romantic stage but the romantic stage is kind of like a you know the motivation <laughs> like oh i want to keep working on the power struggle like through the power struggle this is it's worth it that person was always worth it right in a relationship where you committed to spend your life with them you know this sense is so deep and strong that it breaks all communication set up between the self and the transcendent, swamps its intuitions of reality, and plunges that self into the state of negation, an unutterable, an, and unutterable misery, which is called the dark night, right? I have a lot of videos on the dark night of the soul. <sighs> It's, yeah, I, I don't have to say how many years it's been for me in this, in that experience. Now we may look at the dark night as at most other incidents of the mystic way from two points of view. One, we may see it with the psychologist as a moment in the history of the mental development governed by the more or less mechanical laws, which so conveniently explain to him or her, right? The psychic life of man or woman, right? Or two, with the mystic himself, we may see it in its spiritual aspect as contributing to the remaking of character, the growth of the quote, new man, right? She says new man. Wow, I didn't know she was going to say that. His transmutation in God. So one, psychologically considered, the dark night is an example of the operation of the law of reaction from stress. It is a period of fatigue and lassitudes lassitude following a period of sustained mystical activity right it is one of the best established laws of the nervous system says starbuck this guy named starbuck not this is written in 1910 1911 right so uh, that it has periods of exhaustion if exercised continuously in one direction and can only recuperate by having a period of rest it's kind of like they say the manic has to come down or people that go get in the high states um have to come down now elliot my friend elliot the musician has a line um in one of his lyrics gonna spend the day higher than high right that's higher than the highs that people run to that's this that's after the dark night of the soul you can be in the state higher than high right gonna spend the day higher than high it's we called it future butter all right my phone um cut off for a second but the sun came back up my phone cut off because i have so many of these videos on my phone it's like for a second see those like, the fog is lifted then we'll go back to reading our book. Look at this. So many tourists come out here and I'm like, you know, they're all taking selfies here. But why wouldn't they, right? All right, I wanted you to have a glimpse. Okay. Oh, I hope I didn't get my car. <sighs> I'm really careful not to get anyone's cars in as much as I can. Okay, so here we were. Sorry, sometimes... Anyway. Uh... She was talking about your body in, uh, as Evelyn Underhill was talking about your body, when you're still a mystic, your body still goes through all these different things. Like if St. Teresa of Avila 
experienced levitation. Her body experienced that. She talked about her body feeling really cold. And um, there was a lot that was talked about last chapter in ecstasy. So long, however spiritual he or she may be, the mystic, so long as he is in the body, cannot help using the machinery of his nervous and cerebral system in the course of his adventures. His development on its, on its psychic side consists in the taking over of this nervous machinery, the capture of its centers of consciousness in the interest of his growing transcendental life. Insofar then, as this is so, that transcendental life will be partly conditioned by psychic necessities, will be amenable to the laws of reaction and of fatigue. I think that's where it cut off. Each great step forward will entail a period of lassitude and exhaustion in the mental machinery which he has pressed into service and probably overworked. When the higher centers have been exhausted under the great strain of a developed illuminated life, with its accompanying periods of intense lucidity of deep contemplations, perhaps a visionary and auditory phenomena, the swing back into the negative state occurs almost of necessity. Uh-oh, I had a really nice morning. I'm Okay, I don't want to just apply this to myself, but I'm sure you're applying this to your own life. I'm like, it was like, what goes up must come down. People that go in manic stages, or like I said before, yeah, go get high on something, they come down. They come down. There's, there's the hangover, the payback, right? And so this isn't a payback. This is just, you're meant, I don't know people that have been purified without going through some kind of dark night of the soul. Now, sometimes it's really fast. Sometimes their whole life was like a dark night. And so they have a huge awakening, you know, this is the psychological explanation of those strange and painful episodes of the lives of great saints and also of lesser initiates of the spiritual sphere. When perhaps after a long past, long life passed in close contact with the transcendental order a full and growing consciousness of the quote presence of God, the whole inner experience is suddenly swept away. I don't want you to be afraid of that, but, and only a blind reliance on past conviction saves them from unbelief. Who's she's quoting. This is from a book called the psychology of religion. Page 24, the great contemplatives, those destined to attain the full stature of the mystic, emerge from this period of destitution, however long and drastic it may be, as from a new purification. It is for them the gateway to a higher state, but persons of lesser genius cannot pass this way. If they enter the night at all, it is to succumb to its dangers and pains. <sighs> That's why they say this is a razor's edge, you know? And you have to stay humble because you have to keep asking God to help you through each stage. Or there are many ways that you can get seduced into some kind of relief from the dark night, right? You can get burned and burned and burned and burned and burned from all the ways you try to get out of the dark night until you just surrender, right? And you're just like, all right, okay, I give up. I give up. I give in. I give, I give up. I give myself up. That's what I say. Surrender up. You're not surrendering, you're surrendering up to divine love. Or N, you know, because the kingdom of God is within you. Well, you're surrendering to God nevertheless, right? The creator. Um, but persons of lesser genius cannot pass this way. If they enter the night at all, it is to succumb to its dangers and pains. This great negation is the quote, is the sorting house of the spiritual life. Here we part from the nature mystics you know they're like yeah i love rainbow double rainbow <laughs> i have a video with a double rainbow too was, i was so stoked when i saw it. i'm like it's a double rainbow <laughs> i'd already seen that other guys anyway um you know where you're just like in a blissful state in nature like we just saw some right i'm seeing it right now for us right and i have a lot of videos where you're down there watching it it just gets loud and stuff like that Anyway, here we part from the nature mystics, quote, nature mystics, the mystic poets, and all who shared in and were contended with the illuminated vision of reality. Those who go on are the great and strong spirits who do not seek to know, but are driven to be. Um, and she says, and I'll just put this quote down here. She says, 
An example of this occurred in the later life of Saint Jean Francois de Chantal. See the Nuns of Port Royal by M E L E W N. Oh no, L O W N D E S. Lounds. Loundus. Oh, 1909. So the year before she wrote this, you know, page 284. Anyway, we are to expect then, as part of the conditions under which human consciousness appears to work, that for every affirmation of the mystic life, there will be a negation waiting for the unstable self. You had your warning. All right, but it's worth it. It's worth it, right? I mean, ask any of the saints, they can tell you, right? <sighs> this rule, I mean, look at Mary. Mary, look what she, she had Mary, the mother of Christ, like had to watch her son be crucified, but also got to watch him rise from the dead and got to serve people after that and tell people about that. Imagine all the people that got to know Mary. You know, they can't deny that she was the mother of Christ, right? And the people that saw him resurrected, like that, it's, it's just so profound, right? She could tell us, you know, Mary, like queen of heaven, that it was all worth it. All of it was worth it, even the worst. I can't imagine watching him be crucified, but that's what our deaths are. Our dark night of the soul, Christ enters them with us. We're not alone. We're not alone. That's what makes it endurable. That's what makes it like the ocean, you know, and the sun. Because you're with the sun. And no matter how dark it gets, and it gets really dark. <laughs> I don't want to sugarcoat it, so anyway, I'll let Evelyn talk. Um, there will be a negation waiting for the unstable self. This rule is of universal application. The, the mystic's progress and horizon, for instance, is marked by just such an alterna alternation of light and shade, of dark contemplation and sharp intuitions of reality. And you know this from Psalm 23. Just David, I'm like Saint David. King David was talking to us about this. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, there's a blind man walking in front of me right now. Look, I'll show you his back. I'll do so. This guy is guiding him. I don't know if you saw both of them, but... Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death where it feels like I am blind and worse than blind, on fire while I'm blind. <laughs> you know, never going to be loved by anybody. That's what it feels like. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will I learn to fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff. Your, the rod, like, is the hook that pulls you back, you know, or the staff does that, and the rod, like, beats off the wolves, right? They comfort me. They come, they come forth for me. They comfort me. Anyway. Uh, and sharp intuitions of reality, with a capital R. So, too, in selves of extreme nervous instability, each separate joyous ecstasy entails a painful or negative ecstasy. The states of darkness and illumination coexist over a long period, alternating sharply and rapidly. Many seers and artists pay in this way by agonizing periods of impotence and depression for each violent outburst of creative energy. It makes me want to calm down now too and not be so elated from, from the beautiful presence I experienced this morning. The periods of rapid oscillation between a joyous and a painful consciousness occur most often at the beginning of a new period of the mystic way, between purgation and illumination, and again between illumination and the dark night. For these mental states are, as a rule, gradually not abruptly established. Mystics call such oscillations the game of love the game of love like um queen freddie mercury was really into reading all this esoteric work i won't say if he got lost or not whatever I, that's uh, between him and god right you you were never meant to judge another person's servant it says that i think jesus said that i don't remember who said it in the new testament but um play the game play the game play the game the game of love right it's a game of love 
And so mystics call such oscillations. I did a whole hour teaching on, on that, but it's not out because I don't have the rights unless it's out now. My lawyer's meant to be working on it. <sighs> you guys, if you're Christians, you know, or believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you know, the creator, pray for me, please. There's so many, so much beautiful ways to help people on this path that are being blocked right now um, because I don't know how to get to the next stage and I'm just waiting on God and waiting on my Jewish lawyer and waiting on whatever else to, to get the rights right so that you can pray for me please it helps when people pray sincerely mystics call such oscillations the game of love in which God plays as it were hide and seek with the quest questing you know you're on a quest questing soul and I looked up the other day the word for sin I'd never seen this before yes it means hamartia to miss the mark of perfection or miss the point of life but when you look up the word mare it also means to miss your destiny it has something to do with destiny to miss your port to miss anyway so um, a game of, uh, with this questing soul, that's what reminded me of that. I've already quoted a characteristic instance from the life of Ruhlman Merswin, who passed the whole intervening period between his conversion and entrance on the dark night of the, on the dark night, or quote, school of suffering love in such a state of disequilibrium. Thus to Madame Guyon, who has described at great length and with much elaboration of detail all her symptoms and sufferings during the oncoming and duration of the night, or as she calls its intensest period, the mystic death, <sighs> traces its beginning in short recurrent states of privation or dullness of feeling, such as ascetic writers call aridity, in which the self losses oh, sorry, self loses all interest in and affection for these divine realities, which had previously filled its life. This privation followed upon, or was just, uh, was the reaction from an illuminated period of extreme joy and security in which, as she says, the presence of God never left her for an instant, so that it seemed to her that she already enjoyed the beatific vision, but how dear I paid for this time of happiness, she said, for this possession, which seemed to me entire and perfect, and the more perfect, the more it was secret and foreign to the senses, steadfast and exempt from change, was but the preparation for a total deprivation, lasting many years without any support or hope of its return yeah between this state of happiness and the total deprivation or true dark night comes the intermediate conditions of alternating light and darkness and so i was told it was like this it's like you know you're going up here and and it's a steady progression like this but you know and each day has its own way downs and ups and you know that really helped me I, I did a video on that said this graph I drew it on sand or something like saved my life many times when I thought you know because when you're in that horrible state it feels like it's going to be that horrible forever and you don't see a way that you could possibly endure it but God will always give you a way to endure it and it's not forever it just your feeling state is not connected to your logical state so the feeling state feels like it's going to last as Madame Guyon never attempted to control any of her states, but made a point of conforming to her own description of the, quote, resigned soul as God's weathercock. You know how the weather, uh, you know, the rooster will go this way and that way with the, with the weather, right? It's just telling you, well, here's the weather today. Here's the weather today. It's up, it's down, whatever. We have in her an unequaled opportunity of studying the natural sequence of development. Natural for her, because God will take everybody on a different road, but usually this dark night of the soul is, is there. So I endured, she says, long periods of privation towards the end, almost continual, but still I had from time, 
to time inflowings of thy divinity so deep and intimate, so vivid and so penetrating that it was easy for me to judge that thou wast but hidden from me and not lost. For although during the times of privation, it seemed to me that I had utterly lost thee, a certain deep support remained, though the soul knew it not. And she only became aware of that support by her subsequent total deprivation thereof. Every time that thou didst return with more goodness and strength, thou didst return also with greater splendor, so that in a few hours thou didst rebuild all the ruins of my unfaithfulness, you know, not having faith that this too shall pass. You know, as Julian of Norwich says, all shall be well, all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. Um, thou didst rebuild all the ruins of my unfaithfulness and didst, didst make good to me with profusion all my loss, but it was not thus in those times of which I am going to speak. Um, that's from her life, I think, from the book of her life. Here we have, from the psychological point of view, a singularly perfect example of the violent oscillations of consciousness on the threshold of a new state. Some people say new levels, new devils, right? It's just like, you're, you're going to, you know, it's worse. It's worse for us. I have experienced this a lot before the dawn's about to break, right? It's always darkest before the dawn. So don't be afraid of the darkness. Just keep asking God and keep asking God to help you be faithful in those times so you don't turn away to any kind of shortcut, right? Because then you really go into despair because then you feel like, you know, but just ask for forgiveness. Ask for forgiveness. God can always forgive. No, you can't out the love of God, to quote Latoya Okia. One of, one of my coaches, right? Well, I chose her as a coach for some part of my life when I was going through this, experiencing this. She's full of the spirit, you know, but anyone, anyway, I always say anyone can fall off the path. I don't want to be negative, but like they can. So don't put your hope in man, you know, but here we have from the psychological point of view. Okay, I already said that. Um, the old equilibrium, the old grouping round a center characterized by pleasure, affirmation, by pleasure, affirmation has been lost. The pleasure affirmation has been lost. The new grouping, grouping around a center characterized by pain negation is not yet established, right? Where you're seeing the negative aspect of God, but you're seeing God in the negative. That that takes time to establish too. Madame Guyon is standing or rather swinging between two worlds, the helpless prey of her own shifting and uncontrollable psychic and spiritual states. But slowly the pendulum, you know, instead of going back and forth, gets closer to this middle. The pendulum approaches its limit. The states of privation, as she says, become almost continual. The reactions to illumination become, become less and less. At last, they cease entirely. The new state is established and the dark night has really set in. <laughs> the theory here advanced that the dark night is on its psychic side, a part, partly a condition of fatigue, partly a state of transition, is borne out by the mental and moral disorder, which seems in many subjects to be its dominant character. When they are in... When they are in it, everything seems to, quote, go wrong with them. <laughs> they are tormented by evil thoughts and abrupt temptations, lose grasp not only of their spiritual, but also of their worldly affairs. Hmm. Their health often suffers. They become odd and their friends forsake them, right? Their intellectual life is at a low ebb. In their own words, trials of every kind, exterior and interior, interior crosses you know you're facing your cross abound but jesus said count the cross count the cost take up your cross daily and follow me now now trials take an n block e n b l o c i think it's french mean a disharmony between the self and the world which it has to deal nothing is a trial when we are able to cope with it efficiently things try us when we are not adequate to them right when you feel like i can't cope over and over and over and especially when you've been so competent in different areas of your life you know i'm a doctor right things try uh when we are things try us when we are not adequate to them 
when they are abnormally hard or we abnormally weak. This aspect of the matter becomes prominent when we look further into the history of Madame Guyon's experiences. Thanks to the unctions and detailed manner in which she has analyzed her spiritual griefs, this part of her autobiography is a psychological document of unique importance for the study of the dark night. Now, humbly, I'm not saying this out of any kind of pride, but so far, if you'd like to watch any of my 900 videos, we now have a video description of what it looks like to go through the dark night because I've been making videos for almost four years now consistently and um, you can see where I was and what I had to experience and what I had to keep facing and fe keep keep facing and trying to document it and just encourage people in in the middle of all of that because I always saw it as you know, most always, the Lord is my shepherd, therefore I lack nothing. You lack nothing. Even though you feel so deprived of everything, when you keep choosing to give what you have, then you know, you can know that you are in abundance. It's just a little trick that God led me on. God led me on that. I didn't know it was going to be that. All right, we're going to wrap up. As her consciousness of God was gradually extinguished, a sort of mental and moral chaos seemed to have invaded Madame Guyon and to have accompanied the more spiritual destitution and miseries of her state. Quote, so soon as I perceived the happiness of any state or its beauty or the necessity of a virtue, it seemed to me that I fell incessantly into the contrary vice, as if this perception, which though very rapid, was always accompanied by love, were only given to me that I might experience its opposite in a manner which was all the more terrible because of the horror which I still felt for it. It was then, oh my God, that, oh my God, she's saying to God, you know, that the evil which I hated, that I did, and the good which I loved, that I did not. I was given an intense perception of the purity of God, and so far as my feelings went, I became more and more impure, for in reality the state is very purifying but i was then very far from understanding this ellipsis my imagination was in a state of appalling confusion and gave me no rest i could not speak of thee oh my god for i became utterly stupid nor could i even grasp what was said when i heard thee spoken of instead of that heavenly peace in which my soul had been as it were confirmed and established there was nothing but the sorrow of hell ellipsis i found myself har hard towards god insensible to his mercies i could not perceive any good thing that i had done in my whole life the good appeared to me evil and that which is terrible it seemed to me that this state must last forever for i did not believe it to be a state but a true falling away for i had been able to believe that it was if I had been able to believe that it was a state or that it was necessary or agreeable to God, I should not have suffered from it at all. Like you wouldn't suffer if you knew, but when you're in the middle, sometimes it feels like you have fallen away and there's nothing you can do to bring yourself back, you know? All right, I wish you much love.